So really think about this follow-up appointment. Think about shortening it. Think about making it more succinct. Think about how your systems flow into it and away from it and making sure that we've booked in our follow-up appointments. If you're struggling with these follow-up appointments, then it's worth creating a package as the only way to work with you. Make sure that that second appointment is close to the first one so you're carrying on building that rapport. Mentoring with Geraldine is a bite-sized practitioner podcast for naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists, coaches, and practitioners. This podcast responds directly to the needs of you, the practicing natural therapist. We have interviews during the holiday season and business and mindset support each week so you'll get the variety you need to enjoy and stay motivated in your practice. Don't forget to subscribe to receive the weekly episodes And if you want to connect with me, always check the show notes because that's where you'll find the links to book appointments and of course to join the Academy, the membership group where there's constant connection and community with like-minded practitioners. Now, let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome to Mentoring with Geraldine and the Bite Size Podcast. How the devil are you? Don't forget that if you email me, I will email you back. I love to connect with people. If you write a comment, I will totally reply to your comment. It's great to catch up with you again today. This is number three in our series about the appointment themselves. So in our first episode, we talked about that discovery or focus call. Last week, I talked about really listening in that first appointment and letting them have that time to share their information with you. I also talked about making sure that you decided how the system was going to go with their appointments so that they understood where the flow was with their appointments. And hopefully, if you've had a chance, you've recorded an appointment so that you can listen to your own nuances. You can audit your own performance, not that of your client. You don't really want to re-listen to everything. I'm sure you've remembered what they had to say to really be able to audit your replies, your responses, and what you're regularly saying throughout the consult so that you can broader understanding of your own consult skills. Now, in today's episode, we're going to talk about the follow-up appointment. For some of you, that might be the elusive follow-up appointment. I hope not. But if it is you, then we need to talk. We need to sit down and we need to have a chat. But that's not going to happen straight away because you're putting it off or you're in denial, then let's just have a listen and let's figure this out together. My clients always come back because throughout the appointment, I say, when I see you next at your next appointment. And so if I forget at the end of the appointment to book them the follow-up appointment, they say to me, when am I seeing you next? So here we are at the next appointment. If they're not coming back, why not? You need to contact them maybe you're booking those follow-up appointments too far in advance. Maybe you're going monthly. Like back in the day when I qualified, we'd have our first appointment. Then we wouldn't see them for a month or six weeks because they would take their supplements. They would change their diet and they would do what they needed doing because they didn't have the distraction of their telephone. They weren't on their laptops the whole time. You had time to sit down and organize things. It was handwritten for you. Like I would handwrite the notes for them. I would handwrite the plan. They'd put it on the fridge and off they would go. Very different these days. Everyone's interrupted by everything. Are you being interrupted right now listening to this podcast, for example? Think about the last time you listened to a podcast, were you interrupted? While I'm here and you're listening to this podcast, have you got notifications coming up on your phone? So it's a struggle for our clients to do things like they used to. So we don't want to be booking them in in a month's time. That follow-up, the second appointment, needs to be one, maximum two weeks after that first appointment. And you might be saying, oh, well, you know, they live a long way away. Well, make the second appointment a telephone appointment. Tell them that you do, you know, a live appointment, then a telephone, then a live, then a telephone, so that they don't have to drive into town or whatever. A lot of them, I know a lot of my mentees who live in the countryside, and they always say people love driving in. They'll drive in for two hours because they want to come in anyway. They'll do everything at once. They'll come to their appointment, they'll go to the shops, they'll go and visit, and they'll do all the things. So they want that connection because they live out on an isolated farm or whatever. So we have to think this follow-up appointment, if they've not come, why have they not come? We need to find out. 
We need to audit our own behavior that was recording your appointment, especially if people aren't coming back. Do you sound desperate when you tell them to come back? That's a worry. Let's hope not. The, what we're wanting is this positive reinforcement when we talk to them so that they feel empowered by what you're saying. So they feel empowered to do what needs doing. But when they start falling off the wagon because they've Googled something else, then you've actually got them back. You can pick them up and you can get them back on the road to recovery. <laughs> For example, my daughter sent me a photo of her friend's hand. She had lots of spots on her hand. She'd just been away. She'd just come back. She had all these spots. It was a terrible photo. And I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. I thought it was later than it was because it was light coming in. It's actually a light left on next door. But I thought, oh, it's a daytime already. I'll just check the time. And looked and there was a message from my daughter. So I opened it up. And there was this terrible photo of a hand. She's like, what is it? I'm like, oh, my God, I can't even see through both of my eyes, let alone look at this photo. And I said, oh, is it molluscum? It might be eczema. And then my daughter's, because I've started making suggestions, she started Googling them. And within 30 seconds, she'd come back with a photo that looked just like it. But then 24, 48 hours prior to that, she'd messaged and said, I don't feel well. According to Dr. Google, I have a brain tumor. Can I have a chat? (laughs) So we all know how easy it is to get the right information and the wrong information. She had a cold, by the way. She doesn't have brain tumor. So these follow-up appointments are really important for our clients. They connect us to them again. They help create, improve on that rapport that you created in the first appointment. And not only that, in this follow-up appointment, we can ask those other questions we didn't ask at the first appointment. They will tell us things they forgot to tell us in the first appointment. And we can check on any boundaries that may have hiccuped into the way between then and now. Like I said, you know, they might have a needle phobia we didn't know about. We've given them homework to do and it turns out we've asked for them to write their meals in or something, write down a seven-day diet diary, which is what I used to do with all of my clients. And they've come back, oh, I forgot to do it. Now, when someone forgets to do something like a seven-day diet diary, the ones who always forgot for me were the ones who were on eating plans, who were dieting. Because They didn't want to write down that they'd had a slice of chocolate or a coffee with milk and two sugars or whatever it was, okay? So the barriers are always quite clear if we and our client don't get upset about questioning around it. We can look critically at it and go, well, do you know why you haven't written it? Oh, I just keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. Okay, I don't need to ask you anymore. You're here for diet advice. You're here to lose weight and you won't fill out a diet diary. When you don't work, you haven't run out of time. This is something you're not doing because you're avoiding it. You've got barriers going on. Now, I'm not going to say that out loud, am I? I'm going to say, but I am going to say, so what do you think the barriers are behind you not writing these things down? How about we do a 24-hour diet recall? Okay, so here we are at lunchtime today. What do you intend to have for lunch? What did you have for breakfast? What did you have for dinner last night? What did you have for lunch yesterday? What did you have for breakfast? Did you have any snacks yesterday? Any chocolate, Coke? And then it all starts coming out. So we're not putting them on the spot. We're not making them feel stupid or evil or whatever or causing them more overwhelm or discomfort. All we're trying to figure out are their barriers. And often we don't have to vocalize to know what a barrier to something is. We work around it. So this person wouldn't do the diet diary. She'd remembered it from her first appointment that she was supposed to come back to every appointment with a diet diary. She never bought a diet diary back ever. And she'd always rock up and go, I haven't done the diet diary. I just feel like, okay, there we go. Not to worry. Let's just do a diet recall because I knew what the barrier was. But I let her keep thinking it in the hope that maybe she would get over this barrier. We did hypnosis and all sorts of things. I'm not seeing her now. She had to see another practitioner for medical reasons. But towards the end of our time together, she started bringing me a diet diary, not fully completed, but with a lot more on it than the zero that I'd had right in the beginning. So we've got to take our time with these things sometimes. Once we know what the barrier is, sometimes we can't vocalize what the barrier is to our client without sort of dismissing them or making them feel bad or whatever it is. We have to think outside the square. They've got a barrier. How can I make this barrier work for me? What can I do differently to make it work? Here I've got my follow-up appointment. Here I'm going to maybe have a presentation of findings if they've given me their bloods and their medical notes. If they haven't, I've just got to wait for them. There might be an issue there that they're not telling you about. But we are 
going through their problems as they've told them to us. We're making those follow-up discoveries. Now, the sicker a person is, the shorter the appointment has to be. Now, that sounds a little bit unintuitive, but the sicker a person is, the less energy they have to give you their information. They will need to go and lie down. So when someone's really sick, you're having a really short amount of time with them and you're using the rest of their appointment time to do work for them, but without them being in your space, without them being with you. And it's really important that they understand that and you understand that as well. And the follow-up appointment shouldn't go over 45 minutes. And that, when we get to the massage appointment, we've got them coming in on the hour, we've got the Instead of five minutes to settle down, they now they, they sit down, they strip off those clothes or they get on the Zoom and they say hello and they're done, they're ready to go. There's not going to be that little bit of chitter chatter that there would have been otherwise. The time for them to tell you what happened, what changes have been made since I saw you last, or what differences have occurred since I saw you last. So we're now not asking them for their life history like we did in that first appointment. Now we're asking them for a recap between last time and this time. Okay, so it's this fort week or this fortnight or whatever it is. It's this recap of the time between your last appointment and now, what's changed. And so when I have my notes open, yes, I have a super large screen, but even when I didn't have a super large screen, when I was working on paper, I would have their last appointment, the roundup of the notes, and the current one sitting there. So I could look over and I go, so last time I saw you, you were going to the toilet 20 times a day. How many times are we going now? Oh, twice. That's brilliant. Last time I saw you, you weren't eating any green vegetables. Are you eating any now? Oh, you've eaten a green bean. Last time I saw you, and so on and so forth. And so now on my screen, I have their last appointment there, and then I have this appointment. And if it's something major, like going to the toilet 20 times a day, now we're down to two, then on this timed notes, I would write initial appointment 20 times bowel movement or whatever, this appointment to only one today. So that the next time I saw them, oh, it's one every day regularly now or whatever it is. So I can see a true comparison. So I can be talking to them every single time at every appointment about the changes because people forget change. They forget what they were like. They forget how sick they were. So we need to make sure when we talk to them that they're reminded just how sick they were and how well they're doing under our treatment. And if they're not doing those things, if they're not taking the supplement or they've not changed the diet, or it's like a celiac comes to see you and that they won't stop eating gluten. Now that's obviously not going to happen. Generally, your celiac has figured it out and stopped the gluten. But when the celiac comes to see us, they're looking for those alternative foods. And we're also looking, we're going to have to supplement them. And we've got these other supplements that we can help them with. We're going to have to bring up their B12, their iron, all of those things. You know, we're going to help them to digest their food that they can't because they haven't got the enzymes and so on and so forth. So we're going to remind them, well, when I first saw you, you were always bloated, you were tired, you were exhausted. You would go to bed at 7 p.m. You'd get up at 7 a.m. What time are you going to bed now? Oh, you started going to bed at 9. Then the first time I saw you, it was 7 p.m. Then it was 9 p.m. What is your time now? Wow, you're staying up till 10. You know what? You can't stay up past 11 anyway. So we're doing really well. A 10 p.m. bedtime is perfect and so on and so forth because they can't remember. Once you get them well, they can't remember. <laughs> so it's really important that we have those notes there and we can confirm those changes with them. It also means that we will make other discoveries. So when I first met you, going to bed at 7 p.m., you're waking at 1 a.m. and staying awake from 1 a.m. to 5 p.m., going to the bathroom 15 times. I don't know, making this up, obviously. So, and then we're going, okay, so then you've made it to 8 p.m., then you've made it to 9 p.m. That wake up time has moved from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., but we've moved from 7 to 8 to 9 to 10, and it's still at 2 a.m. So, here's a new problem. This is a problem that needs to be resolved. What are we going to do about this? Or we've dealt with your gut problems, but now, you're worried about your acne. You had your acne before, but it didn't bother you because your gut was your major problem or you had solved a skin problem, but now this other problem, which was always there, has come to the fore. But now it's significant to you because the other problems have gone away. We're going to unearth other problems. So we have to make sure when we speak to them that we're telling them about what we've improved so far, all right? So that they know how far they've come. 
Many of them will remember how far they've come. And when you say, oh, well, the first time I met you, you were going to the toilet 20 times a day. I'll say, yes, I know. It's so amazing. Thank you so much. Hey, pat on the back, never hurt anybody for what we're doing, right? So in that follow-up appointment, we're shorter time to recap, shorter time rather than why did you come to see me today? Now it is what's changed since I saw you last. And we're letting them have that five minutes of glory and fame to tell them how much, how well they're feeling. Then we can go into any supplements, testing, whatever, and we can do more of the talking. We need to get them on side the whole time because we need them to do the things, to take the supplements, to go for the run, to do the extra walk, whatever it is. So we need to ask them, is there somewhere that you said you used to enjoy running? Is there anywhere around your neighborhood that you could go for those runs? Oh, it's not safe in my neighborhood. All right. So what can we do instead? What about training machine or... Is there something that you could hire to see if you like it rather than buying a running machine and then never using it and having it as a wasted item? You know, what about hiring one or a bicycle for in the lounge in front of the TV? If you've got a bicycle, just the thing that goes on the front wheel or the back wheel, not the front wheel, on the back wheel. So you can sit there and pedal and you don't, all you've done is spent $100 on a thing rather than buying exercise bike when you already have a bike. How can we think outside the square? to help you do those things once we've uncovered the barriers to improvement, like the neighborhood's no good or it's raining so much no one could run anyway or whatever the barriers are. So we're going through those barriers for improvement. We're finding out what's improved, but what the knock-on is or what the other problem is that was underlying it all along that has been so forgotten about, it's reared its head. I feel great all over, but now I've got this rash that I used to have when I was a kid those sorts of things. So we need to go through those. We need to be adjusting our supplements for them or our herbal mixes. We might be adding or subtracting, might be increasing doses. All the while saying at your next appointment, we will look at this again and we will go through this. The diet change that we need to look at this time, if there's not enough protein in your diet, whatever it is, always reiterating when I see you next. Always booking in that follow-up appointment as well. And making sure that the appointment is around the 45 minute mark, inclusive of everything. And this is the assumption is when I say these times is that you're working by yourself. You're not working for someone else. If you're working in someone else's practice or it is your practice and you have a receptionist, then you can have half an hour appointments. You can have for follow up appointments, you can have 45 minute appointments instead of 50 minute appointments for the first one because you've got someone who's going to book them in. You've got someone who's going to get them the supplements for you or create the herbal mix for you, whatever it is. You've got someone who's going to take the money for you. When you're working in solo practice, you have to do all that stuff and you have to bundle it at some point in the appointment. Now, if you're going to make a herbal mix, I make, when I have the client in my rooms with me, I make the herbal mix in front of them. I'm online. I can't make the herbal mix in front of them. It's on that side of the room. It's over in the corner. My client would just see my background, which you know is interesting. But it's not that interesting. It's not how many minutes worth of interesting while I mix up their herbal mix. So that's when we use those lines of, I'm going to be creating this herbal mix once I've got off this call from you today, or I've got another client straight after you. I will be sending through your link to, I don't know, Araya Health or Oborn or Renner or whoever it is you use as your wholesaler, and Pack Health in New Zealand, whoever it is. I will be sending you through the link to them and I will be emailing you our information from today's console, you will get that by 5 p.m. today because I will do them. I'll sit down and do them all at three o'clock. I will create the herbs. If you're coming to collect them, they'll be available to collect from 5 p.m. When will you be here? Oh, you'll be here tomorrow. I can put them in my esky or whatever it is so that they have a timeline. They know what's happening. They know when they're going to receive everything. You've got their credit card details or whatever it is so you can take the money. I go into Stripe. I pull them up in Stripe and I say, oh, it's the credit card ending in one, two, three, four. And they'll say yes. And I'll say, well, today's appointment was a consult plus the herbs or supplements if they're here in my rooms or if it's just a consult, that's the price. And you'll get your link to the wholesaler. Um, they will email, I will email, you'll get an email from them and you follow the link to purchase your products. I'll say, okay, thank you very much. I'll say it does take 24 hours for them to arrive. So as soon as you get that link, do get on and purchase. If you purchase tonight, they'll be posted tomorrow. You'll get them on whatever day it is. So think about those systems and think about that flow. Again, you might want to record a consult to see how that consult goes, to see what your flow is, to see what you're encouraging. At the second appointment for myself, 
I'm often at that appointment selling my package or my program. I will have mentioned it at the first appointment. I might want to do an HTMA on them or something with interclinical or whatever it is, right? So at the first appointment, I might say something like, oh yeah, there is a hair analysis we can do. We can talk about that more at your next appointment. What you're doing when you say these things is you're leading them, right? You're leading them up. You're saying, here it is. It's forward thinking. We're getting them to think into the future. Now, often at that first point, people will say, oh, let's just do it now. Let's just, let's just do it. I need that answer. Other people go, oh, yeah, I'll think about it. You're like, okay, no worries at all. So at the second appointment, I will bring it up again. At the second appointment, because I just gave a quick lead in or a segue at the first appointment, at the second appointment, I will properly introduce it. I will say whatever it is, what it does, why I think it will help them. Now, we all make a little profit off those programs that other people create, like interclinical, because we're spending time researching. We're spending time looking at their results. It's not just your money in your hand. You're actually doing work outside of the appointment, outside of seeing the client. You're working for the money. So don't be thinking, oh, well, if I sell it to them, I don't know how much, and the company's only charging me how much, oh, I should only charge them wholesale. No, because you're doing work. (laughs) You're still working. It's not true profit. True profit is something that just lands in your bank account because you haven't done any work for it. Okay. And I don't know what that is. I've never had money land in my bank account because I've done nothing. I've always done something to get money, right? Just like this. If you join one of my programs, if you take up the challenge of joining me on the 90 day program and developing your business, then the money just didn't just land in my bank account. You thought about that. You took time to think about that. You thought, I'm going to book a focus call with Geraldine. I'm going to go through everything. I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to improve my business. And this is how I need to do it. So money isn't landing in my bank account and it doesn't land in yours. There's no such thing as a free ticket, right? Or there's free tickets to everything, but there's no, (laughs) but a winning ticket is always hard to find. So really think about this follow-up appointment. Think about shortening it. Think about making it more succinct. Think about how your systems flow into it and away from it and making sure that we've booked in our follow-up appointments. If you're struggling with these follow-up appointments, then it's worth creating a package as the only way to work with you. Make sure that that second appointment is close to the first one so you're carrying on building that rapport. Now, next time, we're going to talk about all the other little side things about reactivating the clients and all the other little side things that happen with our appointments. If you've enjoyed today, I'd love a review. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully next week. Subscribe, follow, do all the things. Chat with you next week. See you soon. Thanks so much for joining me today. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast for the weekly episodes. If you'd like even more support and learning, then the Academy is for you. Here you'll find part two of the herbal discussions, more clinical learning, and case studies to support your clients in practice. Bye for now.